Hi everyone, this is Georgina Sampat, Global Marketing Coordinator for Floor Life, and welcome to another Fresh Cut Flowers webinar. This time we're going back to basics and we're going to be discussing care and handling. Um, as you know, this is a monthly initiative. Every last Thursday of the month, we host a webinar that focuses on flowers, flower varieties, and flower care. And our goal is to bring you useful educational information in 30 minutes. On your screen, you can see a table with dates and topics. These are the upcoming webinars that we're going to host. Um, definitely jot down the ones that you're interested in. Before I hand over to our host, uh, Technical Support Representative Emma Bradford. I just wanted to let you know that if you have any questions during the webinar, that you can send them th to us through the chat on your screen. Definitely do that because at the end, Emma will take some time to answer all your questions. So, Emma, take it away. Thank you, Georgina. Well, hello and welcome to our seventh webinar in the series. As Georgina just mentioned, my name is Emma Bradford. And today, as many get ready to go back to school, I'm going to go back to basics and I'll be talking to you about basic flower care and handling. So, going over our little roadmap of where I'll be taking you today. Firstly, why is proper care and handling so important? then where in the supply chain it is important, and then I'll show you how to carry out proper care and handling. And lastly, I'll finish with some fun facts. So, why is proper care and handling so important? Well, let's put all commercial considerations aside for now and just focus on the biology of cut flowers. Now, a cut flower is a living and breathing thing. So think of it as a plant whose roots have been removed. So it's still going through all those biological processes it would be doing if it still had its roots. But now it isn't able to replenish its resources through its roots. So things like water and minerals. And it's not able to efficiently carry out photosynthesis anymore. So it's vulnerable and it's susceptible to poor handling. Now, let's talk vase life days for a moment. When a flower is harvested, it will have a set amount of vase life days in it that it will be able to achieve. Now, how many days of vase life it has will depend on many factors, like whether it's a rose or a chrysanthemum, which variety it is, and then lastly, the environmental conditions it was grown in, so the growing conditions. But the point is, once that flower is harvested, the maximum number of vase life days it can achieve is preset. Nothing you will do will add vase life days. However, there are many ways in which you can reduce the number of vase life days by improper care and handling. So the reason proper care and handling is so important is because it gives you the tools to retain as many vase life days in each flower as possible. So, why would you want to retain vase life days? Well, studies show that how long flowers last is the most important factor by which consumers judge the quality of their flower purchases. So, even though each person may choose flowers based on their type or their colour, even the most beautiful bouquet will not satisfy consumers if it doesn't last at least seven days. So, where in the supply chain is proper care and handling most important? Is it at the start with the grower? Or maybe once it reaches a supplier or the wholesaler? Or maybe the most critical part is that once it reaches a supermarket or the florist? Well, the answer is all of the above. Proper care and handling must be carried out consistently throughout the supply chain. Think of the supply chain as an assembly line. If you're making a product, and let's say you're making a television, each 
person along the assembly line adds their part until at the end of the assembly line, you end up with a finished television, for instance. Now, the supply chain is very similar to an assembly line, but I want you to think of each stage a flowers go through, like the grower, the transit hub, and the wholesaler, etc., as each person on the assembly line adding their part, right up until the flowers reach a consumer. Right, so far, so similar. However, there is one very big difference. With a television, you can plug in the finished product to check that it works. And if it doesn't, then you can trace back to where on the assembly line the problem occurred and then fix it. But with flowers, we don't have that luxury and we can't tell if they've been, they've been mishandled and will suffer a shortened vase life just by looking at them. And it's for this reason that it's critical that flowers are handled correctly at each stage of the supply chain to prevent further quality issues. So now you know the why and the where of proper handling, let's go over the how. Now, as you can see, there are a few key elements of how to do proper care and handling, but don't worry, I'll be going over each of them in turn and in detail. So, if you've been following the Floral Life webinars this year, you'll already know that temperature is the most important factor for preserving vase life of flowers. And the optimal storage temperature for most cut flowers is between one to three degrees centigrade. But for tropical flowers, they should be told at 12, remember? Difference for most flowers, tropicals have their own. And for optimal vase life retention, these storage temperatures should be observed at all stages of the supply chain. So that's everything from grower all the way to they reach the consumer. Now, just to show you how much difference storage temperature can make on vase life, this graph shows the vase life of flowers that have been stored at 4, 7 and 20 degrees centigrade. As you can see, the flower stored at 4 degrees C reached a maximum of 12 days vase life, whereas those that were stored at 20 degrees C only reached 4 days. So, just by controlling the storage temperature, you can have a massive effect on vase life. So, how should flowers be handled? Well, this slide gives you a good overview of basic handling procedures. So you should ensure all services that come into contact with flowers are clean. Remember, flowers are fragile, so handle those stems gently. Remove all foliage that will be below the water level. Cut your stems by about two to three centimeters with a clean, sharp knife, secateurs or scissors. Always place the flowers in a flower food solution. Do not place your flowers in direct sunlight and keep them away from drafts. And do not place the flowers close to fruits or vegetables. So those are the basic guidelines. Now I'll explain each one in a bit more depth. So after temperature, hygiene is the next factor which affects vase life that can be controlled. So Temperature and hygiene, you have complete control over those, those aspects. So basic hygiene should be observed on all surfaces, buckets and tools that come into contact with flowers. And they should be cleaned using a commercial cleaner product such as the Fluoride Cleaner Plus or the Fluoride, Fluoride DCD Cleaner. Now by practicing good hygiene, this will help to keep your bacteria and pathogen levels in check. Now, when prepping your stem for placing in a post-harvest solution, recut your stems with a clean, sharp blade. Now, it doesn't matter if you cut with scissors, a knife, or secateurs. So long as it's clean and sharp, it will be fine. Also, the cut doesn't have to be at an angle. Straight across is fine. Then remove any leaves that will be, that will be below the water level. Now, it's important to remove the leaves that will be below the waterline, but leave the leaves above this. 
So the ones above the water level should be left on. Why should we leave the upper leaves on a stem in place? Well, it has to do with the way in which water moves through the plant. Now, if you cast your mind back, way back to the very first webinar, which was Botany 101, you'll remember that plants have water carrying tubes called xylem. And these tubes run all the way from the roots up to the tips of the leaves. Now, inside these xylem tubes, the water molecules form a long continuous chain. You can think of these water molecules holding hands with each other in a long chain from the roots all the way up to the leaves. Now, when one molecule is transpired from the leaves, it causes the water chain to move up that xylem by one molecule, which in turn pulls one more water molecule into the xylem from the roots. And this is basically how water moves through all plants, always from the roots up to the leaves. Now going back to our flower stem and remembering that they are still alive, the water moves through them in exactly the same way. And by leaving the upper leaves intact, this will also help to draw the water up the stem to keep the flowers hydrated. So remembering cut flowers are just plants whose roots have been removed, what do they need to stay alive? Well, there are three main needs. The first being water, just like all life. The next is food. And the third is trace minerals. So not that different to animals, really. Now, normally a plant will be getting all of these things from their roots and through photosynthesis. But as cut flowers have no roots and photosynthesis is limited, we use cut flower food to keep them hydrated and nourished. So what exactly is flower food designed to do? Well, it does three things. One, it keeps the water moving up the xylem tubes. Two, it provides food in the form of sugar. And three, it decreases the pH of the water to somewhere between three and five. Now, the reason the pH is important is because flowers uptake water better when it is slightly acidic. So just to show you how much difference a good flower food can make, this graph shows a vase life reached by three different types of flower. A rose, a sunflower, and a gerbera. Now the dark green bars show the vase life of stems of each flower that were kept on water only. And the pale green bars are the flowers that were placed on flora life flower food. And you can see that just by adding flower food, we were able to preserve between four and nine days of vase life as compared to water only. And this is just a photo showing the same thing, but using different flowers. And the flowers on the left were kept on water only, and the flowers on the right were kept on a floral life flower food. Now, I can show you many, many photos like this, but the best way is to see it for yourself and try it at home. So buy yourself a bunch of roses, make sure they're all the same color, so all the same variety, and then divide that bunch in two. Then place half of the stems in a vase with water only and place the other half in a vase with flower food. And then just observe for yourself how much difference adding flower food makes compared to just water. When using flower food, it's important to get the dosing correct. So I bet there isn't one person out there who, before they began working in the flower industry, ever read the instructions on a sachet of flower food. I know I didn't. I mean, you just cut the sachet open, pour the food into a vase, and fill it with water to the top, right? No, that's the wrong way. The amount of water you add is very important. Add too much water, and your flower food will be underdosed. Meaning, you will have added some sugar but you won't have created an environment to help keep those bacteria in check. So the bacteria in the water, and trust me, there will be bacteria in the water just because bacteria is everywhere. The bacteria will go, woohoo, food. And because they won't be kept in check, 
they will really go to town and really multiply. On the other hand, if you add too little water, meaning that your flower food will be overdosed, you're really just wasting your money because you're using more products than you need to. So to make the most out of your flower food and maximize the benefits gained from using it, always dose it correctly. Now, another way to help your customers enjoy their stems for as long as possible is to choose the best varieties. Now, just like some breeds of dog are better at some things than better than others, there are many different varieties of rose, each with its own unique characteristics, including the maximum number of vase life days it can achieve. And this isn't just unique to roses. You can find varieties of all crops which perform better than others. Now, the graph here shows the difference in vase life days between two different varieties of gerbera, rose and lily. Now, all the conditions are the same. It's only the variety that's different. So it's the same flower food, same temperature, exactly. Just the variety that changed. And you can see that there was a difference of between seven and 12 days of vase life between the two varieties. So always choose the right variety. Now, <clears throat> remember a few slides back when I talked about the importance of hygiene? Well, this is the reason it's so important. Bacteria. Now, like I said, bacteria will always be present. And it's not cost effective or necessary to try and achieve sterile conditions. But it is important to keep bacteria levels in check. So what's so bad about bacteria? Well, bacteria can be sucked up into that xylem where it can cause a physical blockage, preventing water from getting up the stem. And then when this happens, flower food is no longer able to keep the flower hydrated and nourished and it can lead to premature wilting and bent neck. So how do we keep bacteria in check? Well, that comes down to good hygiene and always using a correctly dosed post-harvest solution in your buckets or vases. So let's talk about botrytis for a second. Now we've all seen it, we've all had to deal with it, but what is it and how does it kill flowers so quickly? And more importantly, how do we deal with it? Well, what is it? <clears throat> it's a fungus. It's a necrotrophic fungus, to be exact. What does that mean? Well, it means that it likes to feed on dead plant matter. And it will kill healthy tissue in order to make it dead. So, pretty nasty, really. And how does it do this? Well, kind of like plants make seeds, fungi produce spores, which is one of the ways infection can spread. And spread it will. You can assume that all flowers carry botrytis spores to some degree. But just like plant seeds, these spores require warmth and humidity to germinate. Okay. So bearing all of that in mind, let's look at one rose stem. Now, botrytis spores can be present on the stems, on the leaves, and on the petals. But if that's the case, why do we mainly see infections on the petals? Well, it's because of the way the rose parts are made and how easy it is for the botrytis spores to get into those parts. So when a botrytis spore germinates, it produces lots of little shoots, just like in the picture. And at the tip of each of those shoots, it releases a toxin. Now, it uses this toxin to produce a wound or opening on the plant through which it can enter. And then once it's in, it can start killing and eating the plant from the inside. Now, imagine this is happening all over your rose stem. Lots of botrytis spores germinating all over. If a spore happens to germinate on the stem, where the skin is quite thick 
and also protected by a waxy cuticle, it will be very difficult for that botrytis to make a wound and to get inside the plant. Meaning that the spore will have spent its energy germinating, but without access to food, it will pretty much wither and die. Kind of like a plant seed may germinate on poor soil, but it will die if it doesn't get water and nutrients that it needs. And it will be the same story for spores which germinate on the leaves or other green parts which are tough to get into. But the spores that germinate on the soft fleshy petals, those spores have got it made. Because the petals are much softer and easier to penetrate, once the botrytis is in, it can spread like wildfire. So even though botrytis spores can be all over a stem, we only see them develop on the petals because that's where they are successful at entering the plant. Now, the biggest question, how do we prevent the spores from germinating in the first place? Well, remember your old friend temperature? Botrytis spores require warmth and humidity to germinate. So storing your stems at one to three degrees will prevent your stems from developing botrytis. But then there are other ways you can prevent botrytis, and that is to treat them at the farm with an anti-botrytis product, such as floral life transport paper, or even ethyl block. And lastly, good hygiene will prevent the spread of botrytis spores between your flowers. So after all that, can there possibly be anything left that wants to ruin your flowers? Well, yes, and that's ethylene. So what is ethylene? Well, many of you will know it as the ripening hormone. If you've ever used a trick of placing a banana with other fruits to help them ripen, then you've already used ethylene, as ethylene is the reason that this trick works. So ethylene is the plant hormone which triggers ripening, which if you're trying to produce fruit is a great thing. But if you're in the business of keeping flowers alive, then it's a killer. So why is that? Well, going back to the birds and the bees for a moment, a flower's function is usually to attract pollinators. And once a flower has been pollinated, the plant gets triggered to produce ethylene. And ethylene, being a hormone, acts as a messenger within the plant. And the messages it is sending are, the flower has done its job, we've been pollinated, begin ripening the fruit and producing seeds. Oh, and by the way, drop the flower because we don't need it now and it's draining our resources. So it's time to kick it to the curb. Which again, is fine if your goal is to grow fruit, but very bad if you want to keep nice pretty flowers. So to see this in action for myself, I took two bunches of spray carnations. Now, one bunch I exposed to ethylene at the vase on the right, and the other one I kept away from ethylene, and that's the vase on the left. As you can see, the bad effects of ethylene can be dramatic. So how do we prevent ethylene from doing its thing and harming our flowers? Well, first we have to understand that ethylene comes from two sources. One is internal, meaning that that's when the plant makes its own ethylene, and external, meaning other sources of ethylene that our flowers can come into contact with. And these can be other flowers, fruits or vegetables. It can be from gas-powered forklift trucks, burning organic material, or even bacteria. Now, the good news is that there is a way to protect your flowers from all of these sources, and that's a product called Ethelblock, which contains an active ingredient called 1MCP. So how does it work? Well, Ethelblock is a gas treatment which contains an ingredient called 1MCP, and once it is applied, the 1MCP molecule binds to and blocks all of the ethylene receptors inside the plant. 
This means that when ethylene does come along, there are no more available receptors for it to latch onto. And if it can't latch onto a receptor, it can't send out its messages and the flower gets to stay attached to the plant. Now, just to show you how effective Ethelblog is at protecting ethylene sensitive flowers, I ran a trial on sweet peas. Now, sweet peas are one of those plants which produces a lot of internal ethylene, and that's why they're so short lived. But just look at the photos on this slide. Now, the top picture shows a vases of sweet peas which were left untreated. And the picture on the bottom shows vases of sweet peas which were treated with Ethelblock. Now, for both photos, this was day six of vase life. So you can see how dramatically Ethelblock can prevent ethylene damage and it will work on any ethylene sensitive crop to help preserve vase life days. Phew! That's a lot of info. So let me summarize all of that for you. So when it comes to temperature, <clears throat> always maintain your cool chain. Handle your flowers with care because flowers are still alive. Maintain strict processes. Having a routine will ensure quality every time. Hygiene, cleaning will prevent cross-contamination. Water quality, understand your water source. What water are you actually using with your flower food? Flower food is crucial to water uptake. Bacteria blocks stems and hurts vase life. Botrytis germinates in high humidity and warm temperatures. And lastly, ethylene can cause premature death. Okay. Time to shift gears and have a few fun facts. So, have you heard the Amazon rainforest being called the lungs of the world? Well, it's not just a name. In fact, 51% of the oxygen on Earth is produced by the Amazon rainforest. So, I guess we'd better take care of it. Then, after air, the next most important molecule to a lot of us is caffeine produced, of course, by the coffee plant. But contrary to what we may think, it's not primarily made for the enjoyment of humans, though, but is to act as an insecticide to ward off insects from eating its leaves. Mmm, just think about that next time you enjoy a brew. Then, we all know apples float, but did you know that it's because they're about 18% pure air? Maybe that's why they're so low in calories. Now this one is more of a spot quiz than a fun fact, but the plants on this slide represent three fruits, one vegetable and one flower. Do you know which is which? Well, starting in the middle, a head of broccoli is actually an inflorescence of flowers. So you can stop telling your kids to eat up their veggies and eat up their flowers instead. Hey, it could work. The bottom left is rhubarb, which we usually eat as a dessert, but it's actually a vegetable. And then all the rest are fruits. So pumpkins, olives, and cucumbers are all actually fruits. So now you can all go and impress or annoy your friends with some new plant facts. Any questions? Thank you, Emma. That was really good. Um, yeah, during the presentation, we did get a few questions. Um, I'll start off with the first one. My grandma used to use a little bit of soda in water um, I'm, or a penny, I'm guessing, instead of flower food. Do any of these home remedies really work? Okay. Home remedies. Yes, good question. So, I would say most home remedies that I've seen have some sort of essence of truth to them. So there are possibly like some reasons why it would work. However, nobody has actually like thoroughly tested those home remedies to say, yes, you need exactly this amount of this, this amount of this, this amount of this to actually get the most out of your flowers. Flower food, on the other hand, 
our R&D department, when we develop new flower food, is we will have a variety of different formulas, at different uh, concentrations, and we will test those against a plethora of crops and a plethora of varieties, and we will decide, our R&D will decide, okay, for the most amount of flowers, this formula is the best. So it's very thoroughly tested to know exactly what ingredients need to go into it at what concentration. So really the best that is your flower food. Um, the other thing to consider, if you want to use pop or soda or whatever in your flowers instead of flower food, um, it's probably gonna cost you more actually for a bottle of pop than it will be for a little flower food sachet. So it's actually more cost effective. Okay, thank you for that. Um, then we got another question. You recommend cutting stems, but you have a flower food sachet that says no cutting necessary. Should I still cut the stems when using this? Ah, very good question, yes. So we do generally still recommend cut the flower stems just in case. Now, that's because we're not sure which flower food a person may use with those flowers. So to be on the safe side, we do say, yes, cut your flowers. However, if you are using any of our express formulas, though you don't have to recut, which in some trials I've seen, stems which have not been recut actually perform better than cut ones, which goes completely counterintuitive. But yeah, it's one of the benefits of having express formula. So if you are using a Floral Life Express formula of any kind, you do not have to recut the stems. That's correct. Okay. And then our last question, can we use ethyl block at the retail floor stage? Is it too late and should the flowers be untreated at that time? Or should it be too late if the flowers are untreated at that time? Yeah. That is a good question. And yes, that is correct. So with ethyl block, the where they will most likely be exposed to ethylene is during the supply chain. So we want to get those ethylene receptors blocked as early as possible. So really the best place to apply ethyl block will be at the grower before they get into any trucks or any dispatch to go anywhere through the supply chain. So you really want to protect your flowers as early as possible. So they all need to be done at the grower so that it is protected by the time it enters the, the uh, supply chain. If you do it at the end, so once they've reached the wholesaler or the supermarket, they will have already encountered quite a bit of ethylene, chances are. So they need to be protected and treated as early as possible. Okay, thank you. That was it, no more questions. Um, thank you everyone for joining us and we hope to see you next month. Emma, thank you very much for the great presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Georgina. You're welcome. Goodbye, everyone. Bye.